Hey, let's jump into this really quick. So, so, so last week we introduced this new shape series, a, a series where we're going to address and unpack what God's word says. And that's really, really important because you didn't come in here to hear Jim's opinion or flat iron stance on or whatever that means, all right, or, or Scott's ideas on something, all right. No, no, no. We're going to unpack what God's word says must be in place for a male to fully embrace and live out a God-given, God-imaging masculine identity. What we're running after is this. What is the shape of biblical manhood? What's the shape of a man, right? And, and what, we're, what we're going for here are the internal characteristics that manifest themselves in external behaviors, actions, and choices. Our choices on the outside, right? And so if you weren't here last week, last week, we haven't even gotten into this series yet. Last week was just an introductory series. And I spent most of my time actually talking to women, just calling two, kind of like two big elephants in the room, just, just saying them out loud. If you weren't here, let me just kind of review those for you. First, it goes like this. I, I called out a reality that many of us are afraid to, to say out loud, at least in our culture today, but I did it. That's what I do, all right? And, and a bunch of heads started nodding, right? And my inbox filled up this week with the green messages. But the elephant or the reality that I called out last week goes like this. Many, if not most guys, don't even know what the definition of a good man is. We don't know. Let alone what God has to say about it. So most, most guys, all right? And I'm going to use those words intentionally. I'm not using the word man. I'm using the word guys here. Most guys, we just make it up as we go. Or we look it around and we see what other guys in the world are doing around us and go, well, I'll be like them. They seem like they have it figured out. But most guys, we don't know. We don't know. We can't say for sure if we're a good man. I mean, sometimes we have a good day. And we feel like I think I was a pretty good day, man today. But overall, I don't know. Uh, if you want to be really, really honest, most guys don't think that they measure up. Most guys, if they were honest... We look at you and go, no, I, I don't think I'm enough. Which is why most guys are failing at masculinity, marriage, and fatherhood. Most. And that's not, again, that's not a very popular thing to say out loud in the world today, but it's still true. See, 50% of kids in the United States are growing up without their fathers under the same roof. All right? And it's not the kid's fault. A lot of the kids think it's their fault. Did I do something? No, no, no. It's not your fault, kids, all right? So that was the first thing. The second elephant in the room goes like this. The biggest beneficiaries of a series on biblical manhood are women and their sons and daughters. We're going to really lean into men, really push into men. But the biggest winners, especially if these men will lean into this, are women and their sons and daughters. See, again, we, we looked at this last week. Most of the world's problems are caused by boys age 20 to 60. Right, right? I heard one author say, you mean boys that can shave? Exactly, all right, right? Guys, guys who spend their lives trying to prove to other guys and prove to themselves, to, to, to the old tapes and messages that are, that are in their head that have, have been in there for a long time that, that play over and over. We're trying to kind of prove something that I really, I'm trying to prove I am a, a good man. I'm good enough. I'm strong enough. I'm man enough. But we look at this story that Jesus told last week, a story about this good Samaritan who found a person who had been beaten and stripped by robbers and, and left dying in a ditch. And just like that story, there is a path of destruction behind these guys who are trying to prove something to someone. And the string of victims in their wake include the bodies of their wives or their former wives or their girlfriends or their sons and daughters. A lot of us guys, we look behind us and there's people that we love lying, laying in ditches, run over and demolished by these guys who are trying desperately and unsuccessfully to hit and answer a moving target question that goes like this. Am I a real man? Am I enough? I'm not sure. And so again, this is where we looked at last week. Rather than simply whining about the world or complaining about the condition of our world and the fact that there are too many women and sons and daughters getting ripped off and abandoned and thrown in ditches, let's go after the robbers. Let's go after the robbers who are leaving people in ditches. What Meaning this, we're gonna go upstream to the source of the problem, which is the internal chaos on the inside of men who aren't sure, aren't sure if they're man enough, aren't sure what the definition of a good man even is, and who don't know what must be in place in their lives, according to God, for God to look at them and say, or, or for us as men to look in the mirror and say, and actually believe, you're a good man. That's what we're going for. I'm a good man. I'm man enough. I'm, a ma I'm, I'm good. That's what we're running after. We don't know. And so using the acrostic S-H-A-P-E, shape, we're going to look at five characteristics that according to God's word, that's important, a man must have in place on the inside, internally, for him to be able to look in the mirror and know, I measure up, I'm good, I know I'm a good man. And it's not just for men, all right? Again, ladies, you got to lean into this. Ladies, those same five things, five char characteristics that every woman in this room, and I told you last week, you should bring notepads and a recorder and a camera because you need to memorize these. Five characteristics that every woman in this room must be looking for in a man. Well, if the last one didn't work out, in the next man, if she's ever going to be sure, I can trust him, I can feel safe with him. That's all introduction. Last week and a half, all introduction. Let's dive into this shape of a man. So our first word... Obviously starts with the letter 
See, you're, you're paying attention. Good, all right, all right. And, and when you first hear this, if you're anything like me, first, sorry about that, but if you're anything like me and you hear the word I'm gonna give you that starts with the letter S, your, your reaction will probably be something like this. Really? Because that doesn't sound very masculine. That just doesn't sound very manly, all right? So, so I'm gonna throw it out here, all right? So get ready to take pictures, get your cameras out. It's better to take pictures like that. It's just easy, you won't forget. But a real man has decided, decision to submit. That's the word. A real man has decided to submit. By that I mean surrender to a greater authority. Now, time out before we just lean into guys here for a second, all right? I wanna talk to ladies, all right? Ladies, please, please lean into this, all right? While that certainly applies to you, if you're gonna live a productive, abundant life as a woman, the life that God, God wants you to have, all right? Honestly, when you read things like that, you all seem to do this better than we do, all right? And here's what I mean. When I say something about men, women seem to be able to like do the math in their heads and in their hearts and look at that sentence and go, oh, that applies to me too as a woman. I mean, I, I need to do that too, all right? So women are pretty good at that. Not so much with men. We're, we're bad at this kind of math. For example, all right, if this was a series on biblical womanhood, all right, and I said this true statement, a real woman has decided to submit to a greater authority, which again is a true statement, all right, all right, the, the, the ladies would go, okay, all right, but all the guys in the room would go, that's right, ladies. <laughs> Write that down, honey. Write that down, all right? So, that, right, all right? I mean, you start, you, start, you start like high-fiving people around you and stuff like that. That's just, that's just, that's just true, all right? I love this church, all right? But, but you'd be high-fiving people, all right? Because you, you don't know any, guys, you don't know any verses in the Bible, but you know this one, all right? You don't know where it is or who said it, but it goes something to the effect of the man is the head of the house and a wife is supposed to submit to him. So amen, I love Pastor Jim. He's just awesome, all right, right? So, so, so most of us guys would go, I, I like that, I like that. But very few of us guys would do the math and go, that applies to me too. We're not very good at that, right? I mean, guys, we're, we're all into the, 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 this whole idea of this concept of submission as long as we're in charge and being submitted to. That's good, all right? See, guys love a pecking order as long as they're the ones that get to do all the pecking, right? I was gonna say as long as they get to be the head pecker, but that sounds horrible. <laughs> it's, it's very descriptive, but I'm not gonna say that because there's kids in the room. But so... Um, you're welcome. You're, you're, you're welcome for that car ride home conversation. So, Mom, what did Pastor Jim mean? And why do people... Look, you're welcome. All right, so let's move on. But most guys cringe... <laughs> some of you don't even get it. That's all right. That's good. Bless you, all right? Most guys cringe at the idea of connecting masculinity and manliness with the word submit. I don't want those in the same sentence. As in, a real man has decided to submit to something or someone who's in a position of authority or higher status or greater importance than him. I don't want to admit that. Because if a guy agrees to submit to someone or, or anything or, or anyone, it would mean that we would have to admit that somebody has something that we need that we don't have or can do something better than, than we can do. And we hate saying that out loud. I don't want, I don't want to admit that. See, many guys have, have believed that authentic manhood means finding ways to prove that you don't need anybody. I don't need any help. I can do it all by myself. Why? Because I'm a man. That's what we grow up with, being told, right? You know, all of our lives were like this. All, all of our lives. We do it our whole lives. We do it with every other person. We, we do it with every man. Every man that we meet, we get into this big giant peeing contest. Every man from nursery school all the way to the funeral home. It's like everything is like a comparison. I'm, I'm as good as he is. I'm better than him. He is. Mine's bigger than his. Muscles, penises, brains, salaries, truck tires, sports teams. Yes, I said it. I use the medical term. Write me. I don't care. But also, right? But every man in this room goes, yeah, my car is better than his car. My, every, right? Everything is a comparison. We do it with every man that we meet all, all our lives. We also, we always try to act like we have everything all figured out around women. Ladies, we don't. There's something you didn't know, all right? But, uh, but, but whenever there's a woman, we just we, like, put on this face around our wives, girlfriends, some pretty stranger female walks down the street and we're like, yeah, w which way to the weight room, right? I mean, we're just like, we, we just like, I have to look like I've, I know everything. I don't need any help. We, we do it a lot with our kids. Don't, don't want me men. We, we walk around the house or whatever, right? and dad always has to act like he has his stuff all together. Dad's in charge. I, I know what I'm doing, all right? And we especially, we do it a lot with God. We act like I don't really need God in my life until we run into a brick wall, run our family into a brick wall, and we, we realize you know, that, I, that we're forced to admit, maybe I don't have it all figured out. And maybe that might not have been the best decision. And now, God, I need you to step into my mess and bail me out. And then God does that, but then we go right back to, it's all good, God, I'll call you if I need you again. Other than that, leave me alone. 
See, that's another tendency of guys. Guys, guys wanna be number one. Guys wanna be the boss until the boss has to be accountable for running themselves or their families into a ditch. Then comes all the blaming and the backpedaling and all the, hey, somebody should have helped me. She should have helped me. That's not my fault. I can't do this all by myself, really? Because you act like it 99% of the time, right? As long as it strokes your ego and gets you what you want, I don't need any help. But and we're gonna look at this more in a minute, but, but here's my point in all that. Independence and that whole, I don't need anybody, nobody's gonna tell me what to do mentality is not the perspective of a man. Independence is the delusion of a fool. If you think you're independent and you can do everything by yourself, the Bible, we're gonna look at this in a minute, you're, you're foolish. See, 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 think about this, all right? Think about this. If there is a God, and we're gonna go with that, Okay, we're gonna go with that assumption, all right? If there's a God, then God created you to be a man. And as the one who created you, he's the one who gives you purpose. He knows the purpose for which you were created. And again, do the math. This just makes sense. The best way for you to fulfill your purpose, your destiny, is for you to place your trust in the one who created you and put you here in the first place. That just makes sense. He, he created, he made me. He probably knows how my life will work best, Right? So go, go back to the, the, very, the first two or three chapters of the Bible, Garden of Eden, all right? Oldest story in the book. Adam and Eve's world did not fall apart because Adam listened to the voice of his wife, Eve. I actually grew up thinking that. It's her fault. She ate the apple and she tricked him. That's what I, that's what I, what I grew up believing. It's not true. No, Adam and Eve's world fell apart because Adam let go of and stopped listening to and trusting the voice of his creator, God. When God said, Adam, submit yourself to me and do what I tell you to do because it's true. And if you'll do that, you will live. But if you don't do that, if you do something else, you'll die. And everything fell apart. See, Adam's problem was not the voice of his wife. His problem wasn't his wife. Even though Adam tried to blame his wife, it's her fault. Tried to blame Satan, tried to blame God, tried to blame his circumstances for this is why I, I had to sin, why I had to do it. And God didn't buy it. God's not gonna buy that because none of those things were Adam's downfall. That's not why he blew up his life and his family. No, Adam's problem was that he refused to listen to and submit himself to God. That's why everything fell apart. So let me personalize this. Let's bring it into this room, right? Most of a man's problems come from his refusal to listen to and submit himself to God and what God says to do and not do. And that's just true. Let's even more personalize this, all right? Men, ask yourself if this is true in your own life or not. Men, most of your problems come from your refusal to listen to and submit yourself to God and what God has told you to do or not do. Just look back over the history of your life. It can all be traced back to, nope, I let go of God. And if you had done what God said to do or started doing from this point on what God has told you to do or stopped doing what God says, don't do that, many, if not most, of your biggest problems in your life, in your marriage, in your dating life, in so many areas, of parenting, all that, if you would just hold on to God, many of your biggest problems would change and some would just go away. And I know we've got arguments in our head right now, all right? And, and, and you're probably right. But you know what, you, you can't change other people. That's not what this is about. So don't start pointing fingers and blaming her or them or, or your dad or whatever on all your other problems. Listen, I, I'll, let's just call this out. I'm sure that whoever you're connected to did some stuff wrong. I, let's just call that out, all right? I'm sure they screwed their, 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 their relationship up. That, they have their part in that, all right? We're not talking about that. I'm talking about your stuff. Men and women, I'm talking to you about, about your stuff, your role in the biggest problems of your life. Not his or hers, your role in the biggest problems of your life. And if you lined up your life with what God's truth says, most of your problems get better. Most of our problems never would have happened in the first place had we held on to God's truth. You can argue with that all you want, all right? But the point is, we're not here to do this big, I told you so. See, you shouldn't have sinned. See, you shouldn't have screwed up, all right? Because right? there's no point in that. None of us came in here to rehash our past. We're trying to figure out a better way, right? A, be a better future. So let me say all that a different way. How about this? Nothing is gonna change in the future, at least for the better, until you begin submitting yourself to what God says is right and true. It's the only way. It's the only way. There's not even a second place. The only way to, to fully live and be all that you were created to live and meant to be is to place your life back into the capable hands of your creator. There's no other shortcut. Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. Solomon is the, the second wisest person to ever walk on the face of the earth next to Jesus himself. He says this, pretty famous verses. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, with everything. And do not lean on your own understanding. Well, it makes sense to me, right? Don't, don't, don't lean on that. In all your ways, in everything in your life, acknowledge him, acknowledge God, and God will make straight your path. He'll clear the way. He'll show you what to do. Just hang on to him. And most of us start, stop reading right there, but look at these next two verses, all right? He says, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. And that word fear, we're gonna look at it in a minute, means trust that his intentions for you are good. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. 
something different than what God says is true. And here's the results of this. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. You get that? You gotta, you gotta pay attention to that, man, all right? Trusting in and submitting yourself to God doesn't just make you feel better, you know, warm, fuzzy on the inside. It actually has, according to God's word, has the ability to give life and healing to all the parts of your life, physically, emotionally, and relationally. It can bring life back into the dead parts, the dead relationships of your body, of your whole life, of your marriage, of your, of, of your relationship with your kids. It has the power to bring dead stuff back to life. And this is what God says men, at least real men, really do. Submission, all right? Submission to the one who created you is the gateway to manhood. It's the door, right? But to quote Jesus, small is the gate or the door and narrow the road that leads to life and only a very few find it. See, submission to what God says is true to the one who created you, that's the, that's the first step. That's the doorway in, the first step or character, the, the must have that must be in place for Jesus to say that man is actually living a life like he was meant to live. But Jesus also calls out this other reality. It's very rare to find a man like that who's brave enough to actually submit to what I say is true. A man who sub submits himself to God, there aren't many. So... I told you last week, I bought, I bought some acreage up in the mountains, all right? And the other day I had a picnic up there. I invited some, some people from staff and some friends and they brought all their families up there, right? And my friend Brent came. He brought two of his horses for all of us to ride, especially the, 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 the kids, all right? And so, so when it came time for the, for, the, for the little kids to ride, you could see, you could look at all the moms and they got real nervous. Like, is that beast gonna trample my kid, right? And, 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 and Brent, he just got all the moms together and says, let me talk to you. And he assured them, all right? So he's like, he's like a 1,200 pound Labrador retriever. That's what he said, all right? And meaning this is that he's big, 1,200 pounds. He's strong and he has the ability, he's a horse. He has the ability and the capacity to wreak havoc. He could, he could buck off anybody and trample them under his hoofs. But don't, you don't, ladies, you don't have to worry about that because he's very gentle and you can trust him because he has submitted himself to a greater authority. I know, cutest grandkid in the world. I got him right there, okay. So you say, does he always gonna do that? Get your own church and you can put your kids' pictures up there, all right? So. But think about it, just look at that horse, right? A big, strong animal, that's impressive. But a big, strong animal can't be trusted until he's learned how to submit. That, that horse, if he's not trained, if he's not under submission, he could slaughter everybody in his path. It could be a disaster just waiting to happen, all right? It's the same with people. See, see a, a lot of us, you, you, a lot of you, I, I'll say this, a lot of you all learned the same truth in basic training when you joined the military. A bunch of hundreds of you have been in the military and you learn this like in the first week or two, all right? And that simple truth goes like this. You can't lead until you know how to follow. You can't. You can't be trusted to lead anybody until you know how to follow, right? And it's the same way with just being an adult, be, being a man, all right? I've, I've talked to several of my buddies who have who've been part of the SEALs or the Marines or the Rangers and the thing that all these elite forces have in common is that they, they always operate as a unit, right? Always as a unit. And if any one individual man tries to gain his independence by quitting or I'm not gonna do it that way, I'm gonna do my own thing, he won't make it. He won't survive or worse yet, the whole team could be doomed by his, I gotta be free. I gotta, I gotta do my own thing. See, but, but by submitting, that individual became a part of something bigger than just himself, was able to accomplish much more than he could ever accomplish on his own. Here's a quote from, from a book called Making Men by a guy named Chuck Holton. You should download that on Amazon today. Making Men by Ch Chuck Holton, all right? Take a picture of it, right? He says this, every boy on this planet was created for a purpose. And that purpose is all part of God's greater plan for this world. Submitted to God, a man will find a new kind of freedom and power to be more than he could ever be on his own. See, God was saying, be all that you can be long before some marketing department got a hold of it. Long before some recruiter got it. God was saying, join yourself to me You'll be more than you could ever be on your own. Now let me switch gears for just a second because I've been reading a lot of books. More than Scott. <laughs> All right, not that that makes me a man, but it kind of does. But anyway, so anyway, so a smart man. But anyway, so I'm studying several authors on this subject, a biblical definition of, of manhood. All right, and, and if you were trying to prioritize what what what's the most important characteristic? There's a lot of authors, everybody has an opinion. And several authors that I read says, well, the most important one that I think that a boy or a man should have in place is the word courage. Courage is the most important thing. And, and I thought about that and oh, I thought that makes sense. That makes sense. See, courage doesn't mean that a person isn't afraid. See, I'm a man, I'm not afraid of anything. Well, then you're an idiot. There's stuff to be afraid of, all right? So, so courage doesn't mean that a person isn't afraid. No, courage means having the guts to do the hard thing despite the fear. Despite your fears, right? That's just true. Courage means I have the guts, I have the inner determination that, that no matter what, I won't quit. 
I won't turn back that mentality. I'll, I'll do the hard thing, the right thing, even though right now I, I don't see or I can't understand how God is going to do and accomplish what he promises to do and accomplish if I'll just submit to him and obey. I'm going I'm to submit anyway. And so, so right there we link up these two characteristics. Let me put them together. Because for a man, for anybody, but let's say, talk, talk to men here. For a man, few things are going to take more courage than to submit to what God says is true and will always be true and will never change. That's going to take guts. A lot of guts. God, God, God won't change. But everything else in your world will change. Everything that's filling up your ear and your heart will change. Your world will change. Your circumstances will change. Your culture will change. Your feelings that you, that you feel right now, your current emotions, they, they'll, they'll be different by sundown, all right? And the opinions of your current friends and your current friends will change, right? Politics, always be changing. Constantly be changing. God will never change. God's word will never change, right? It just never will. Neither will his definition of what, when God says this is right and this is wrong and this is true and that's a lie and that's good and that's bad, run away from it. And it's gonna take a lot of courage to submit to God, especially when your feelings or what you believe in your heart or you can't currently understand how God's truth, his way is actually better than what you can come up with on your own. I don't understand how that's true or right or better. So I'm not gonna do it. And this is where I think a lot of us Men, guys, whatever you want to call us, are, are failing the most. See, too, too many men cave, cave in at, at the mere hint that something might, that's going to be hard, I'm out. Or inconvenient to their personal feelings. Or, or what about me and what I want? Or if something painful or sacrificial might be required of them. No, that, that costs too much. Instead of rising in courage, too many men cower in fear or in selfishness and refuse to submit to what we know God is telling us. We don't have to pray about it. We don't have to think about it. We know God's saying to do this. We look back at God and go, no, I'm not going to do it. It's too hard. Listen to this paragraph from Chris Bruno's book, Manmaker Project. That's another one you should download, all right? Manmaker Project. He says this. And, and listen, parents, I'm going to say some stuff here. If you're not ready to have a conversation with your kid, then your kid should not be in here. All right, so we're running after a biblical manhood. Here's what Chris Bruno says in his book, Man Maker Project. He says, courage just takes too much effort. And who has time for it anyway? It's just easier to roll over and go to sleep. It's just easier to wait and see what happens. It's just easier to focus on the 401k than to focus on today. It's just easier to watch a show. It's just easier to masturbate than engage with her right now. It's just easier to let the high school teacher deal with him rather than me bring it up. It's just easier for the youth pastor to teach him about God. That's just easier. I'm gonna go with that. See, a man of courage holds on to what God says and does, even when it's hard and inconvenient and painful. And that's going to take a lot of courage to do that. You know, by, by comparison, you know, sitting in here and hearing a song or something like that and having your heart all stirred up and, you know, praying a prayer and raising your hand or whatever, it's, it's easy to call Jesus, Jesus be my Savior and take my sins away so that I can go to heaven. And after I go to heaven, I'll obey you. That's not hard. This is a good deal. It's going to take a lot of courage to submit to Jesus as your Lord and your ruler and the commander and final word of how you're going to live your life this side of your funeral. You're going to, that doesn't take a lot of courage. After my funeral, it's not going to be too bad. Between now and then, when I go to college, when I go to work, when I go out of town on a business trip, when my wife has really made me mad, that, submitting to God, that's going, to, that's going to take a lot of courage. And honestly, most of us, man, I'll speak for myself, we haven't done this submitting to God's word no matter what. We haven't done it very well. I haven't. See, most of us, again, if we're really, really honest, here's what we're hoping to kind of work out with Jesus. It goes like this. Hey, Jesus, I am fine with you paying for my sins and making me feel better about my past. I felt guilty about that. Now I feel like you're in my life. I, I don't feel as guilty, all right? But don't tell me what to do now. Thanks for getting me out of hell. Just don't tell me what to do, especially if it doesn't line up with what I wanna do, especially in the areas of how I spend my money, my money, how I spend my time and how, when, and who I have sex with. Hey, Jesus, butt out. I'll try to go to church more cut back on the cussing, butt out. Those are the big three and they're off limits. Those are mine. They are also, I would say, the three biggest landmines that have blown up more men in this room and more relationships in this room than any other thing. Solomon writes this in Proverbs chapter one. He says, the fear of the Lord, we'll talk about it in a minute. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that brings up that word fool I mentioned a minute ago, all right? And that word fear, look at that. As in the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the word fear doesn't mean, oh no, I'm really afraid of God, he's gonna hurt me. That's not what the fear of the Lord means. It actually means I trust that God's intentions for me are good. I, I, I really believe, I trust that, that God is telling me to do or not do something, not because he wants to hurt me or not because he has something really, really cool he's trying to keep away from me. 
but I actually believe God's intentions for me are actually to provide something good for me, something better than I could come, with on, come up with on my own, even though I can't see it at the moment. See, I trust what God says that I need to do because I trust God. And I trust that God is for me, not against me. I'm not afraid of God, I trust Him. Fearing the Lord is what a wise man does. Fearing the Lord is what a wise man does. A fool says, I don't like it, I don't understand it, and I don't see how it would work out good for me, so I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna let go of what God says, I'm gonna do something else. And God says that a person, a man, anybody, who does that is a fool, and the way that seems right or wise in your own eyes, in your own heart, apart from God, if it's different than what God says is true, just like chapters two and three of the Bible, it's gonna kill you. The most important parts of your life. And I know, again, I, I know that this series is targeted directly at men, but let's just be honest. Regardless of your gender, every truth that we've covered applies to everyone. But I do have a few questions for you. I'm not speaking to men, but it goes to everybody. If a real man courageously submits himself to God's word, let me ask you this. What is the biggest, most important thing in your life that's currently not submitted to God's word? You don't have to pray about it or think about it. It's right there, isn't it? Second question, what would need to happen in your life to bring that part of your life that you're thinking about right now back under submission, under the authority of God's word? Third, what's standing in the way of you submitting that part of your life to God's word? And finally, how about this? If you don't submit that part of your life to God's word, where does it go? Play it out a year, two, three from now. And who's most likely to end up lying in a ditch because you robbed them of what God said that he wanted to provide for them through you? Here's why, because you're her husband and you're their dad and nobody else is. That's your job. So if you really are a man, take responsibility and do what needs to be done and bring all the parts of your life, but especially the one you're thinking about right now and wrestling with God about right now, bring that under submission to God's word and get rid of the excuses. Real men, this should be up here. Real men don't make excuses, right? And I've used them all. I don't have time. I don't have the money. I can't change. I've tried before. Listen, I call BS on that. I was gonna say God calls BS, but lightning, I don't know, right? But uh, those aren't excuses. Here's your excuse. Here's the real answer. I don't have the courage to submit. What else could it be? I know what God's telling me to do. I just don't have the courage to to, to submit that part of my life to God. Okay, then own that. Own it. If you really want to be a man of integrity, here's what you should do, man, all right? Gather your family around the table at lunch today and say, say this, all right? Hey, family, I don't have the courage to get my own life in order. I don't have the courage to be your husband or be your dad. I don't have the courage to provide a good, safe home for you or a leader that you can depend on. So, family, you're on your own and you'll probably end up in some kind of ditch and I'm sorry about that. Maybe your next husband or dad will do better because that is what you are communicating and that is what will land on them. And that's called silence, Right? So that's one deal. How, here's the other deal on the table. How about, man, we take a courageous step starting today. Adjust what needs to be adjusted in our life. Do what you know needs to be done to line up your current life with what God says is right and true and better. Take at least a step in that direction. Do something. Just don't sit back and pretend that everything is okay when you know it's not. That will not play out for you well. So I was done here too. And then I was at the gym yesterday on the bike and I thought up some more stuff, I gotta tell you, right? So I have some homework. And you're gonna wish, I wish you would've stopped or fallen off the bike. I wish that, all right, so, so I have some homework for some really courageous husbands, boyfriends, and sons. And for every woman in this room that's connected to one of those, all right? So here it goes. Would you be willing, husbands, to ask your wife this question? Some of you, I stopped breathing, all right? So boyfriends, to ask your girlfriend, and sons, to ask either one of your parents this question. It's a big one, right? It goes like this. Is there one thing in my life that you see that I'm doing that does not line up with me submitting to God's word? You know me better than anybody. We've been together for a long time, for better or worse, all right? So, so I'm just asking you, is there one thing in my life that you see that I'm doing that does not line up with me submitting to God's word? And let me just tell you this. I, I, I went first yesterday with Robin. So I asked her that question. I held onto the, the bedpost. All right, all right. And then she told me something that I already knew. It's none of your business, all right? So, all right, so, is there one thing in your life, all right? So, now there are rules to this homework, okay? Rules to this homework, write these down or the attorneys are just gonna fill up. All right, so, all right, here are the rules, all right. First rule, all right, don't ask this question in the car on your way home today. Don't, don't go, slam, slam. Well, don't do that. (laughs) Don't do that, all right? You will walk home. Yeah, you'll be on 287, right? That's just what you'll be doing, right? Don't ask this question in the car on the way home. This is not a car conversation. Second, ladies, parents, listen. If he doesn't ask, don't bring it up. 
you know who you are, right? If he, don't, don't, don't do it, right? Don't stare at him all the way through lunch. <laughs> don't do it, right? Don't look across the bed before you go to bed at night and go, Pastor Jim said you're supposed to ask me something. Come on, all right? Don't do that. Don't even talk about me in your bedroom, all right? So that, that, just, just that, all right? <laughs> ladies, <laughs> ladies, not your deal, not your assignment. Don't, if he doesn't bring it up, don't, don't ask, all right? Third, all right, if he does ask you that question, wait 30 minutes to give your answer. Don't, don't just react, okay, all right? Take a breath and think about it because if he's asking you, you are the, if not one of the most important voices in his life and what's about to come out of your mouth, he's gonna listen to it. So take a breath and think about it. Again, you're not going after your own agenda here. You're going after the thing that's standing between this, this boy or this man that you love, something that's standing in the way of him really being connected to God, all right? Which gives you the other thing, the fourth thing. It can't be about anything related to how he treats you. Not this time, not first time up at bat. Don't bring up, well, you really hurt my, don't, don't, don't do that. Or may that, that may happen down the road. And here's the big one, all right? right get ready to write this down. Just give him one. Just one. Some of you are going, or two? No, no, no. Just, just you know, he doesn't, don't ask, he's not going to ask this question. And then don't just vomit 10, you know, here's a list right here with this and this, right? Don't vomit 10 years of dysfunction on him this, this afternoon in your living room. Just, just one. Just one. Ladies, how many? One. That was so, or two, three, right, right? No, no. <laughs> how many? One. One. All right, one. Okay, so, because by asking, men, listen to this. Whatever she calls out, we're gonna give our word that I will not rest until I have brought that part of my life under submission to God's word. If you're not willing to do that, gentlemen, then don't ask. If she calls it out or if my parents call it out, I will not rest until I have brought that part of my life under submission to God's word. I will pay attention to it. So guys, you say you wanna be a man. That's awesome. That's great. Do you have the courage to submit to what God says is true and best for your life and for your heart and for your current sexual expression, for your marriage, for your children, for all the most important parts of your life? Because let's be honest, most guys won't, can't, choose not to submit their lives to God. But God says that courageous submission to him is the first step towards being a man that God created you to be. And if you don't get that one in place, we might as well not even talk about the other four. It just, it just, it just won't, it's a moot point, all right? So the shape of a man, it starts with S. A man has the courage to submit. Let's say that out loud, one, two, three. A man has the courage to submit. Question, are you that kind of man? 